so today i'll speak on the topic of how our life journey is obstructed and how it can be facilitated just like say now if we walk on the road then the snow is below us and the snow makes the ground slippery so when we want to walk we slip and fall so basically if we look at when we are going to go on any journey there is something below us there is something in front of us and there is something above us so similarly for us now this is of course physical but also during our life journey there is something below us below us is which we are not so much aware of that is our own self conceptions the things which we assume we all have certain conceptions preconceptions assumptions so those are below us in the sense that we take them as a given truth usually when we are walking when we are talking we don't focus much on the floor unless we know okay the floor is slippery over here we just walking and talking the floor is below us but we don't notice it so similarly all of us have certain conceptions which are often not even visible to us then when we are say walking or driving there might be some visible obstacles so there is something which is invisible because it is below us there is something which is visible because it is right in front of us so if we are driving and a tree has fallen down then we can't move forward that's a visible obstacle and then there is something above us so above us means that we humans have a particular scale of perception so normally in the normal course of our action just as we don't look at the sky we can if we make an effort look at the sky but normally we don't look at the sky this is quick so similarly when we function we don't look we look at the functional level of reality okay this person is saying like this this is the situation this obstacle has come so we don't examine our preconceptions and we don't even think about the big picture of life what is the nature of ultimate reality looking at the sky is the nature of ultimate reality so broadly we could say that in our life journey there are certain presumptions which are like the ground below us there are certain visible things which are maybe visible obstacles or visible aids in our journey now all of these can be positive and negative our pre basic preconceptions our visible challenges and opportunities as well as the big picture that we think of that we may not always think of so with respect to this if we consider the bhagavad gita the bhagavad gita when krishna when arjuna is about to fight a war at that time see generally we don't look beyond the visible unless we face an obstacle just we face an obstacle that cannot be solved at that level so hey if we face a big tree which we can't move then we think you know maybe i have to call someone and ask for some help like i was in california a few months a uh, few months ago a month ago actually so this forest fires are going on so there's one devotee who is in the, who in the forest fire department so he says that there are times when you're fighting the fire but sometimes the fire is so big uh, the only thing you can hope for is some rains come and then they get extinguished and the thing that you hope never happens is winds come and it spreads so basically when we have obstacles and we face obstacles as long as we think i can manage these obstacles we don't think of anything beyond our normal scale of perception so so arjuna came to fight the war and this was a very important event in his life and he was prepared that his whole life had been a preparation for this ultimate war he had been practicing archery and this was the time when he could exhibit his skills to the fullest of his capacity and at that time now if the enemy had attacked and he had to fight he could have fought but what happened was he got caught in the confusion 
should i fight or should i not fight so and why should i fight or not fight because he was thinking basically what is the right thing to do he had basically two dharmas now, toward the end of the bhagavad gita we have the word sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam raja so i was at a, i was asked to speak at a gita recitation contest and there the students were reciting some of the gita verses so when they came to this verse they recited it as sarva adharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam raja aham tvam sarva papebhyo mokshayishami ma shuchah something is wrong yes. what is the adharman so i asked this the organizers after that they say this verse is why were they deciding like this actually krishna has come to establish dharma so why would you tell you to give anyone to give up dharma it says over the centuries when the bhagavad gita was written down it was written down repeatedly by the manuscript manuscript writers somehow they forgot to put an o <laughs> and now we are putting back what they had forgotten <laughs> so this is the interpretation of one commentator of the bhagavad gita so their idea is why will god tell anyone to give up dharma but the point here was arjuna he had no desire he was not a dharmic person he was already a virtuous person so adharma was not an option for him it was basically two dharmas one is this is his kula dharma and he has his kshatriya dharma his kula dharma was as a member of a dynasty i had to protect the mem- other members of my dynasty and kshatriya dharma as a martial guardian of society i have to protect i have to counter aggressors protect society from aggressors now what do you do if the aggressors are family members that was his dharma sankat that was his dharma sammoha pracchami tvar dharma sammudha cheta as he says in 27 so basically when he got got caught in this dilemma that is the time he started oh what am i to do and so normally when we are driving along a road unless see we could say that if we can't see things clearly on the road say if there is a mist or for whatever reason we can't see then we, what do i do then so normally when we are driving along the road we just think of the road and we think of what is visible but say if we see in front of us a car slipping what happened then we may look down oh there is so much snow over here so usually we just go along the normal course of our life and at that time we neither think of what is below nor do we think of what is above but when such a thing happened at the normal level arjuna just couldn't function what do i do i am just confused i don't know what to do should i fight should i not fight so that perplexity when it came upon him that's when he started looking for a more expanded picture of life a more expanded picture of life means that he started basically the driving question of the bhagavad gita is pruchami tvam dharma sammudha chetah so suppose if we join a class uh, when the question answer session started then we might be able to make sense of the point that are being spoken okay this point is being spoken this point is being spoken but if we have not heard the question then we may understand the point but we may not understand the point of the point <laughs> the point of the point means why is this being spoken so if we know the question and then and the person is answering the question is answering coherently not just rambling off everywhere then the knowing that question helps us make sense of the answer so similarly the bhagavad gita's driving question is pruchami tvam dharma sammudha cheta what is dharma what is the right thing for me to do and in answering that question krishna expands arjuna's vision so first krishna shifts arjuna's vision to the ground below and then he shifts his vision to the sky above So if we are driving, we could have mist in front of us. We could have clouds above us, which will block everything. We could have slippery snow below us. So Krishna begins. The ground below is what is your self conception? As long as you think you are the body, you will be on slippery soil. 
So sometimes we might be in a steady soil with the bodily conception, but sooner or later we'll come to a situation where, hey, what am I to do? How should I function? It's it becomes very confusing and disorienting when the truths that we just presume to be true, they we find out that they are not true. It's it's easy to just live in denial of those things because. there are certain we all need certain fundamentals to be right but if they are not right then it requires a lot of work so what happens is krishna begins by shifting arjuna's vision what is your self conception as long as your self conception is wrong you will slip sooner or later so the bhagavad gita basically demonstrates arjuna slipping because we all have different roles in our lives one role maybe we are a professional in office we might be a mother or a father at home we might be in our in our ex- bigger family we might be a cousin to someone we might be a brother sibling to someone we might be a son or daughter to someone so we all have these different roles and each of these roles can pull us in different directions so now whenever we face any confusion what am i to do in this situation so we need to take a step back okay how, how do i define myself our self conception shapes our response and sometimes we see that the same thing affects different people differently say we come to a program or a get together and we greet someone and that person snubs us doesn't you notice us now for everyone that's unexpected okay what happened but some people they might just be surprised some people might be annoyed some people might be furious and then there is the next time in front of the biggest possible gathering i'm going to snub this person publicly they might just get consumed by revenge fantasies So now, why is it the same thing affects different people differently? It's ironic that quite often the people who get offended the most when others don't respect them are the people who don't respect themselves. If my self-conception is based solely on the respect that others are offering me so then what happens if somebody disrespects me it's like my whole self worth is challenged say if we are we are walking and standing and somebody just passes by and pushes us we'll be a little annoyed but we'll restore our balance but suppose we are living in a tent and somebody comes and shakes the tent and is about to bring the tent crumbling down we'll be much more disturbed because that the tent is our shelter so similarly for somebody whose whole self conception is based on how other people respect me a small snub is like they are being shaken completely their house is being shaken and they react much more aggressively so if we identify ourselves say as a professional then if there's any instability in our job now naturally it will come concern all of us but if that is our defining identity then what will happen is if if, if there is any instability we will feel it's like the end of the world if our defining identity is as a parent yesterday we had a whole session on parenting in krishna consciousness so if our defining identity is that i am a parent if my child starts doing something wrong then i feel oh my whole life is a failure so for each one of us it is our self conception that determines how much some situation troubles us so going back to that earlier point that we all may be standing steadily but if somebody is standing on solid floor somebody is standing on snow now normally both might appear to be equally steady but when somebody is pushed and they slip on solid floor it may not affect them that much on slippery snow they just fall crash so similarly when we are provoked that is when our self conception comes into the picture what is my self conception so what the bhagavad gita does is 
it shifts Arjuna's vision down. He says that you are a soul and they are souls. You are indestructible, they are indestructible. And therefore, whatever is happening in the world, it's not, it's not that anybody is going to be, their existence is not going to be squelched out. The body is going to be destroyed, but the soul is going to be eternal. Soul is eternal and they'll continue existing. So by that, so that vision, even as devotees, we're not always aware of our essential identity. And that's fine. When somebody, we ask somebody, who are you? They start saying, I'm a spirit soul. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I agree, you're a spirit soul. But tell me some name. No, all names are illusions. <laughs> well, not exactly. <laughs> We, there is a functional identity and a functional role. So fun they are important, but they are not all important. Mm -hmm. So th what the Bhagavad Gita first does is takes Arjuna's vision downwards to show him the ground on which he is standing. And he is slipping, he is confused. What I should I do? What I should not do? I am confused. He said this is the ground on which you are standing is slipping. So Krishna leads Arjuna to a steadier ground. You're not, you're not the destructible body. You are an indestructible soul. And then after that, what Krishna does is uh, raises Arjuna's vision. So the Bhagavad Gita, if you see a progression, how it happens is Arjuna's vision is at the level of the body. From the body, Krishna shifts his vision to the soul. So more or less the first six chapters are Arjuna's vision being shifted from the body to the soul. Then the middle six chapters are the vision being shifted to the whole. Look at the ground, then look at the sky. And then after looking at the ground, after looking at the sky, say somebody might just be just walking or ride, uh, driving nonchalantly, cheerfully. And they look down, they just say there's snow. And they look like, oh, there's a dark, it's stormy. And then they look ahead again. So what Krishna does is, in the middle six chapters, he is raising his vision to look at the world, to look at the big picture basically. That ultimately, to look at the ultimate reality, that is Krishna himself. And then, in the last six chapters, Krishna brings Arjuna's vision back to in front of him. But then, what is happening? With this knowledge, how do you look at the world? So in that sense, the Gita's vision, it's basically the whole book, Gita is of vision adjustment. So expand your vision and then focus your vision. And then we see something in a new light. In fact, that is how all knowledge works. It's uh, that when we see something, it's, it's our vision that we don't just see based on what enters into our eyes. It is largely when we put things in context. So there is a content of consciousness and there is a context of consciousness. The content of something is what particularly we are seeing. The context is where it is being seen. Suppose we enter into a building and then we see a big screen over there and a line is flashing downward. We say, okay. As a line flashing downward is not particularly entertaining. It is not particularly, we say, okay, what is this? But then we look around us. I look up and oh, this is a stock exchange. And you see the line flashing down. You see the line flashing down, and everybody catches their head. Oh no! Like somebody is utterly in uninformed. Say somebody is coming from a rural or a primitive tribal kind of background. They say, just one line went down on that screen, and everybody is, what's wrong with you people? No. But that line going down is not just a line going down. <laughs> <laughs> it could be people's fortunes going down the drain, isn't it? <laughs> so what happened is there's a content of consciousness. The content is just a line going down. But there's a context. Okay, where is this line going down? This line is going down in on a screen which is in a stock exchange and it is depicting that stock exchange. They're depicting the uh, trend of stocks. So <clears throat> basically... Jnana Chakshu, Bhagavad Gita talks about the eyes of knowledge is to see things 
not just with our eyes but with our intelligence it is uh, so what the bhagavad gita does is arjuna is saying oh this battle i have to fight this i don't want to fight this what should i do but krishna expands the region to give him context and so the first part of the context i said is that the you are not the body of the soul then the middle six chapters are about the whole look at the sky that why is krishna giving knowledge of himself in the bhagavad gita the whole point is that there is a higher plan to life maya dikshena prakriti suyate sacharacharam hetunane na kaunteya jagat viparivartate krishna says things are happening under my supervision there is a plan over here and what is that plan krishna says that at one level he says suhrudam sarvabhutanam that i am the well wisher of everyone that's it says, so it says that uh, but then uh, in the 11th chapter when he is describing the virata rupa the majestic form of uh, which is spanning across the whole universe so at that time the question becomes what's happening you know it's um, when there was a court case against uh, iskon in in russia they said that they, some people wanted to ban the bhagavad gita so one of the arguments used was that this 11th chapter was described and they said that you know these people they worship a god who is a cannibal <laughs> because they have this vision of all these warriors are entering into the mouth of krishna of the virata rupa so and it is it's quite a ghastly vision this is sadrushyante churnitair uttamangai it is as they are enter leli ese grasamana that as all these warriors are entering into the mouth and then what is happening some there some of them are entering and getting devoured some of them are entering and they are just crashing against the teeth and then it's their head that is cracking crashing and it's cracking apart it's it's a it's it's a very ghastly depiction and not only that is described leli ese so when the head is cracking apart what is happening blood is sprinkling all over and the virata rupa is licking the blood so they say what what is going on over here so the idea over here is it's very deep it's not it's not simple it's the world has a has a as a ghastly side to it death itself is very distressing but death can destruction can befall befall upon people in ghastly ways so there if we have to have a complete world view it has to incorporate the ghastliness of the world also so the idea over here is that it is not, there is no when krishna does exhibits the vishwa rupa the universal form now there is no vishwa rupa loka there is no place where this vishwa rupa exists and this is not uh, something which literally happens it's a vision to demonstrate a particular vision of real a particular understanding of reality what is that that ultimately birth when birth creation maintenance destruction all are phases of one time cycle and this war is a time of destruction so the point is that war is brutal and how do we see that brutality within within a within a spiritual vision of the universe so destruction what is the idea that there is this the destruction of the temporary is essential for redirection towards the eternal the temporary gives way to the eternal and the temporary is not destroyed just to just to destroy the temporary is destroyed because the destruction reorients us hey it's going to be destroyed what should i do i should redirect my vision towards the eternal so that vision towards the eternal is that actually each one of us is a part of the divine that same bhagavad gita which talks about how all uh, the warriors are going to be destroyed in the 11th chapter that same thing describes later that nirvairaha sarvabhuteshu yah samameti pandava nirvairaha sarvabhuteshu do not have any enmity toward anyone so 
that how, how can Arjuna fight a war if he doesn't have enmity towards anyone? So that's the whole vision of the Bhagavad Gita, that do it as a duty. We may have to fight, we may have to, we may have to fight against someone, but we don't have to be against someone. So because the opposite warriors were against Dharma, so Arjuna had to fight against them. But that does not mean that Arjuna had to be, have like innate enmity against him. So the big picture is like, we look at the sky. So the big picture is that, that there is God's plan working in the world and that God's plan is ultimately for the good of everyone. It is not necessary that everything that happens is good. There are some people who have this Gita Sar in their homes. You may have seen that in the summary of the Gita, they call it. And one of the saying, one of the statements over there, Jo hua wo achcha hua. Jo ho raha hai wo achcha ho raha hai. Jo hone wala hai wo bhi achcha hi hoga. Whatever happened is good. Whatever is happening is good. Whatever will happen will also be good. Now, I say this is a, this is, you know, I have read and recited the Bhagavad Gita hundreds of times. I have not found any words anywhere close to this. <laughs> so now this is nice sounding idea, but the Bhagavad Gita is, it's, it's not about what is happening. It is about what we are doing. Dharma is more about how we are responding to things. What are we doing? So it's not that the, now when say for example Draupadi is being dishonored, Krishna never tells, nobody tells Draupadi, no, jo hua, wo achha hua. <laughs> no, whatever happened is good. No, it is, there are terrible things that happen in the world and people have free will. Sometimes people misuse their free will and they do terrible things. So when that happens, Krishna's expertise is not that if he has given free will, free will means people can misuse their free will. And when they misuse their free will, bad things will happen. But Krishna's expertise is that he can bring good even out of the bad. So everything that happens may not be good, but everything that happens can be for good. The two different things. It's not, are things intrinsically good? No, sometimes at certain level things are bad. But good can come out of them. And when will the good come out? It is not that it will automate, everything will be good. It is our choices matter. It is. So, there is an overall purpose to life. And the Bhagavad Gita's vision is that the whole, that whole Virat Rupa is described for what purpose? Tasmat muttishta yasho labhasva jitva shatyun bhumishwa rajyam samruddham mayai vaite nihata purvam eva nimitta matram bhavasav visachi O Arjuna, you act as my instrument. Act as my instrument generically means work in a mood of service to Krishna. So that is the segue, that is the link to the 30, last half of the Gita. That the second half of the Gita, it's uh, not last half, the sec, sec, second one third of the Gita is that there is God who is in, ultimately in control and everything is happening for our ultimate good, for our spiritual evolution toward toward eternal life, toward Krishna and eternal love for Krishna. And then we approach the world, we look at the world with a service attitude. So that's why at the end of the Bhagavad Gita when Krishna speaks, when Krishna completes and Arjuna speaks, Arjuna doesn't simply say, I will fight the war. I will, Arjuna says, Nashto moha smate labdha tat prasadan maya chuta sthitos migata sandeha karishye vachanam tava He says, karishye vachanam tava I will do your will. So it is only contextual and incidental that Arjuna has to fight a war. The essence of the Bhagavad Gita is not to fight. The essence of the Bhagavad Gita is to do God's will. And inclusiveness of spirituality, of divinity is shown that, that within that even something like fighting can be done. But fighting itself is not the purpose of the Gita. The it's harmonizing with the divine will. So the Bhagavad Gita is not a book of violence. It is not a book of silence. It is a book of transcendence. Not violence, not silence, but transcendence. 
whatever will raise our and others consciousness we do that so when we face so, so that so this is i'll now put this together in our our life journey when we face challenges and then we'll conclude we can have some questions so we may face some relationship issues we may see professional issues and face some health issues we may have various kinds of challenges going on in our life and when we have to face those challenges see problems have something very strange about them that the the problems that we face often they just consume our mind and it is as if the if we had a graph say of problem solving ability or clarity versus time if we don't think about a problem at all then what happens we will be unprepared for it so we could say the more we think about the problem the clarity increases okay i should do this i should not do this i should do this it the clarity increases so we could say the graph goes linearly up but beyond a particular time it flattens out we think and think and still not, no further clarity comes and then after that the the graph starts going south so the more we think about the problem <laughs> the bigger the problem seems to become it's it's a, it's, a, it's a fan if it moves round and round it cools us down but when our mind goes round and round it heats us up it is we just get exasperated so we need to have this this when we are facing a problem just like say if right i had a is a problem okay what do i do with this we think about it we get some clarity so in our routine times in our life when we are facing problems we think about the problem we address it and move move on but some problems are such that we can't address them immediately and because they are just nagging problems which are just there we have some fever we take a medicine and we get the fever goes away but suppose somebody has some major disease and you're trying this and trying that and this is not working that is not working sometimes it feel we get relief sometimes we don't get relief so then we need to expand our perspective so expanding our perspective means that we is understand that okay this problem is there but i don't have to think about this constantly i'll think about it as much as i can to deal with it and then after that put it aside so put it aside means how do we put it aside that is why we have to have the we have to look at okay i'm being disturbed by this problem i need to go look down say if we are having some financial issues relational issues if we try to deal with it sometimes we talk with the people and then we clarify things but sometimes we talk with people and nothing gets clarified it just that the more we talk the more things seem to be becoming worse so then okay just just calm down just slow down so now look at our own conceptions if we think that you know okay i am in control and this person should listen to me so then if i was i was at a at a mediation seminar i was at one place where one one of the leaders many devotees had this complaint that the leader was very short tempered so then when we talk with the leader he said i don't have any anger issues people should just start listening to me <laughs> 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 well if people if people were robots they might do that but people are not robots and it's that when somebody doesn't listen to us that's when actually our self mastery or lack of it comes into the picture so <clears throat> basically what happens when we face issues like this okay you know why am i so concerned that this person should listen to me no no but it is this is the right thing to do okay why is it the right thing to do if it is not then why why does it matter so much to me like that we ask ourselves questions and okay because you know if this doesn't work out well if this person does like this if this person like this what will people think about me or what will happen over here what will happen over there so we need to ground ourselves in reality that i am a soul 
this person is a soul i have free will this person has free will and we are somehow working together so i can't really control anything and if you understand okay i have my free will i am a soul what can i do in this situation and then we understand i am a soul this person is soul krishna is in their heart krishna is in my heart ultimately i am meant to serve krishna sometimes we serve with others sometimes we serve through others sometimes we serve in spite of others it will vary but our vision won't get fixated if i understand okay i am a servant of, i am a soul i am a part of krishna i am meant to serve krishna so how best can i serve krishna in this situation so it's like the ganga when it's flowing throughout the ocean if it gets blocked in a particular path then it looks for a way okay can i go below it can i go above it can i go around it or can i just keep hitting it so that it the roads and it moves on so when our self understanding is okay i am is so now self understanding is restricted then we start getting fixated on the path this is how things have to be done and they're not happening then we just get blocked completely but when we get the big context okay the point the path is not important the purpose is important the purpose is the river has to get to the ocean the purpose is okay whatever i am doing you know ultimately i am doing this to serve krishna to grow spiritually in my consciousness to work krishna and of course practically i have to deal with issues but the important thing is it's not necessary that this thing has to work in this way once our vision expands from the path to the purpose okay if this if this is not working out what is my ultimate purpose my purpose is serve krishna and if we keep that purpose in mind then gradually whatever obstacles we may be facing we'll find some way to deal with them and to move on so how exactly that will come that can vary from situation to situation there are broadly three ways and this is itself a class in itself so i won't go into the class but what are the three ways okay <laughs> so we basically call it as tolerate mitigate and immigrate <laughs> what it means is sometimes some situation is there okay i i, I don't like it but i can live with it tolerate tolerate the small a small keep small things small tolerate means not passivity tolerance is keep small things small so that i can focus on big things okay this issue is there but it's not that big i can live with it but if it's too big i can't live with it then we may decide mitigate i have to do something to deal with it i have to i have to fight out out i have to change the situation and we work for that so otherwise we immigrate immigrate means okay the situation is not working out and this battle is too messy it's not worth fighting let me just move on Isi Shri Prabhupa did different things at different times. When Prabhupa was in America, when he came initially, he was staying at the house of Gopal and Sally Agarwal, and there he he found that the people were keeping meat and other things in the they were keeping the meat and other things in the same fridge where he was having his bhoga for Krishna. And when they they a little conscious, they said, "Oh, Swami, we have meat. Oh, Prabhupa, don't think about, it. don't worry about it." Prabhupa just tolerated that. now when he was uh, now if in actual temple if something like that would have happened prabhupal would have been furious but at that time tolerate because that's just, at that time his main purpose is to start sharing krishna consciousness and the whole world is filled with people doing this so he doesn't have to for fixate on that at that time he tolerate then before that when he was trying to start a temple in jhansi they had the league of devotees and there were a group of people who were helping him to build a temple Uh, to start a uh, but then so those same people turned against him and there was a whole mess that resulted so prabhupad decided it's not he he had the expertise and he had the legal documents he could have fought but he decided it's not worth it so yahan see the small city the people here are not very serious and also my spiritual master had said that focus on building temples in big cities so he said it's not worth it so he just immigrated but later on when the movement was established in 1970 around about that time when prabhupad came to mumbai and they got the land in mumbai in jihu and at that time the person who was selling the land was a double dealing kind of person this mr n he wanted to give he he took the money and didn't want to give the land also he was threatening and intimidating and doing all kinds of uh, 
nefarious things. Then Prabhupada said, you know, I will, I will not over my dead body. This person will get the land. The lion for Krishna, I will not let him take it at all. And Prabhupada fought. So he did not emigrate at that and just leave it up. He mitigated. So through it all, whether he was tolerating or mitigating or emigrating, Prabhupada's focus was on serving. So similarly, if we keep that focus, so when we are in a particular situation, at a practical level, we deal with it practically. But sometimes at a practical level, when we are just getting stymied, we are not able to deal with it. Then we need to expand our picture. Look down, look up, and then we understand, okay, I am a I am a servant of Krishna. How can I serve Krishna in this situation? And that, and that question, how can I serve Krishna in this situation? That will become like our guide. Okay, Sh should I tolerate? Should I mitigate? Should I emigrate? And thus, we can move forward in our life through whatever situation life sends our way. And that is what happened to Arjuna. Arjuna, in this situation, recognized that yes, there will be the there will be the pain of fighting against my uh, venerable elders, but they have chosen the side of adharma, so I have to do it. And the Pandavas also had tolerated for a long time when Bhima had been poisoned, when they had been attempted to be burned alive, they tolerated it all. But mm, beyond a particular point, when Draupadi was dishonored, when the Kauravas were just not showing any sign of remorse at all, it is not no remorse, no reconciliation at all. Then the Pandavas decided enough is enough. Now we have to fight. It's uh, there are different ways in which you can understand a person's consciousness. Now suppose you know, we invite somebody for a program and they say, "Oh, no, I'm busy. I got this. I've got that. I can't come." Okay, that's a refusal to the request. But suppose they say, "Even if I die, my dead body will not come for your program." <laughs> 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 then <laughs> that is not just a refusal <laughs> for that request that is a rejection of the person itself isn't it so when Duryodhan did that what did Duryodhan do he said Krishna himself went with the priest proposal and Duryodhan what did he say I won't give even enough land to put the tip of a needle through so that was exactly like this or worse than this, you know. I have no interest in reconciliation at all. So if somebody was that brazen, then the Pandavas decided we have to mitigate over here. So if we keep this attitude, I must, how can I serve Krishna in this situation? Then whatever be the situation, we will be able to find a way forward and move ahead in life. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this topic of how can we face the obstacles in our lives? So, when obstacles come, we took this metaphor of a journey and <clears throat> there, is, there can be a mist in front of us, there can be slippery soil below us, slippery snow, and there can be the big sky, there is a darkness or cloud or a storm or whatever. So, when we have to face obstacles, normally in the normal course of life, we just look ahead and move on. But in the normal course of we are walking and somebody slips in front, oh, what's happening? Then we look down. So looking down is looking at our self-conceptions. We all have certain notions which we never examine. They are, just, they are like given truths for us. But they need to be examined. And that's what the Bhagavad Gita does initially. Arjuna at the level of the body is thinking, how can I fight against my... Uh, initially has come ready to fight a war, but then he thinks, how can I fight against my elders? How can I fight against my relatives? is torn between Kula Dharma and Kshatriya Dharma. So to resolve this, Krishna says, you are neither a member of a Kula, you are neither a Kshatriya, nor a Kshatriya. You are actually an Atma. You are playing both roles. So the, the ground below him, that is a self-identity, Krishna changes that. You are a soul who is indestructible. And then, okay, but even if I'm, but what is ultimately happening in life? That's the big picture. That Krishna, so first, Arjuna's shift is from the body to the soul. From the soul, that's first six chapters is body to the soul. Seven to twelve chapters is what? The soul to the whole. It's what's actually happening in life. That is, how is Krishna acting? So everything that happens is not good, but may not be good, but everything that happens can be for good. 
and that depends on how we respond so the bhagavad gita shows how god is benevolent and god's plan is working through every situation if we cooperate with that and then he brings his vision so look at the ground below look at the sky above and then look ahead again then now he is looking with knowledge so gyana chakshu with eyes of knowledge help us to see the same thing differently like a line slide lying on a screen going down might just seem like a line but it will be seen as a stock market crash if you understand the context so there is a content of consciousness which we often focus on but there is a context of consciousness which we also need to see to make better sense of the content and then arjuna concludes with this vision informed vision that actually i am meant to serve krishna so that's why his conclusion is karishye vachinam tava i will do your will and it's not just fight but to do his will and then we said how we can apply this to our situations we all say face problems in our life and we use our intelligence and deal with the problems so it's some pro- the more we think about a problem the more clarity we get but there are some problems which if we keep thinking is no clarity that comes it flattens out and the more we think it becomes worse so that is the time when when our normal way of functioning is not leading to solutions we need to expand and refocus so if we expanding and refocusing means understanding okay i'm not just a just a professional who is facing this financial issue i'm not just a family member who is facing this relational issue i'm not this body who is facing this health issue i'm a soul and as a soul my purpose is to serve krishna so how can i serve krishna when we have this question coming up then it becomes our vision shifts from the path to the purpose the ganga is on a fixed i have to go by this path only to the ocean i have to whichever path works out so how can i serve that question expands our vision and shows us if not below above round or just grind through whatever so then we discussed the three options when you face a difficult situation what are the three options tolerate, tolerate, tolerate mitigate or emigrate and we discussed how shri prabhupad also adopted different options how the pandavas adopted different options and we can also with that service attitude adopt a healthy option and move on in our lives thank you very much hare krishna hare. so any questions or comments yes ma'am thinking when we are on the mitigate which is uh, uh, there are some certain levels of problems which we are able to handle and in some we feel like there should be a mentor we, we seek some guidance um i am trying to focus or meditate on the idea of surrender that krishna says because just at one point he says sarva dharman parityajya so maam ekam sarvam gaja and other place he says yad ichati so um, what is the right mood i mean right way to ensure that i am surrendered i stay surrendered when i am seeking help of a mentor and okay. to mitigate the problem okay so how can we know that we are surrendered when we are trying to mitigate a problem surrender also has multiple forms if we consider the six limbs of surrender that are described in the well known verse from the puranas anukulyasya sankalpa pratikulyasya varjanam rakshishiti ti vishwaso guptutve varnam tatha atmanikshepa karpanya shadvidha sharanagati so the first two are accept the favorable avoid the unfavorable have faith that krishna is the protector let us know that krishna is the maintainer also offer yourself to krishna and be humble knowing that without krishna you are worthless so these are various aspects of surrender but the first two are very dynamic except that is uh, say except that which is favorable avoid that which is unfavorable so we could say i have a whole series of six seminars on this six limbs of surrender but the first two are actions the next four are dispositions they are more attitudes to be cultivated but action means we are dynamic so surrender what does it mean basically it's a <clears throat> we could have two different models of surrender one is the example of draupadi she raises her hands helplessly in surrender when dushasana is attempting to disrobe us <clears throat> but the bhagavad gita also tells arjuna surrender 
Maam ekam sharanam rajan. Arjuna also says, yes, I will surrender. Karishya vachanam tava. But the Bhagavad Gita doesn't conclude with Arjuna raising his hands up. Hmm? The Bhagavad Gita concludes with Arjuna picking his bow up in readiness to fight. So broadly, we could say there are two aspects to surrender. There is dependence on Krishna and there is diligence for Krishna. So the dependence on Krishna is for the things that are not in our control. In Draupadi's case, practically nothing was in her control at that time. So the only thing that was just offered her consciousness to Krishna. That's dependence on Krishna. Hmm. But now Arjuna was a trained warrior and he had to fight at that time. So his surrender was by diligence for Krishna. So dependence on Krishna for the things that are not in our control, diligence for Krishna for the things that are not in our control. And both comprise surrender. If we think of surrender only as like Draupadi, well, that's true, but that's only one part of surrender. That's not the whole of surrender. We have Prabhupada saying that, Nachao, Nachao, Prabhu, Nachao, Semarthi. So he's not saying, Krishna, let thy will be done. Now, if you see, we have that Jesus toward the end of his, when he's about to, going to be crucified. He says, Oh God, not my will, let thy will be done. That's one way of surrendering. But in Prabhupada, because at that time, it's just inevitable, the, the Pontius Pilate is against him and he is, uh, he is going to say, crucify him. So, he just let die will be done. But, with the Bhagavad Gita's mood is, let me do your will. So, now when, when let die will be done is dependence. But, let me do your will. Oh, Krishna, as Prabhupada says, make me a puppet who dances to your will. That means, let me do your will. So, we have both aspects. So, in any situation, we have to see what is in my control and what is not in my control. And what for what is not in our control, there is dependence. For what is in our control, there is diligence. And both together are surrender. So we could say surrender is a dynamic dance of dependence on Krishna and diligence for Krishna. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, friend. Thank you for the wonderful class again. I was just thinking the way when the goal is very far, and the journey seems to be endless, there is a possibility of being careless. For an example, when I am practicing bhakti, sometimes I am not taking care of relationship, sometimes I am not um, doing my sadhana properly. Because it, it looks like the destination is very far and the journey is endless. How do we really focus and real, realize that underneath realities I am really taking the mood ser of serving and just remembering Krishna? Yeah, it's tough. Say, it's it, because the journey seems to be so far. It's uh, suppose say you are maybe driving through the central part of America, where it's just a long road, or where in both sides you just see wilderness, or just see some plains with nothing. You are driving and driving, you don't even know whether you're moving. Especially if you are in a ship, and the ship is rowing through the ocean. No matter how a ship is moving through the ocean, no matter how much you move, you just see water. You don't see anything else. But sometimes our spiritual journey seems like that. Now we are, uh, at least the ship, we can say it moves by machine. But if, if we are in a boat and we are rowing, I say I am rowing and rowing and rowing, I don't see any land anywhere. How long am I meant to row? So we, it, we, it can become like that for us because in spiritual life, initially there is some dramatic change that happens. We, we may have some gross bad habits which just fall apart by the practice of bhakti. And we are enthusiastic. We feel very enthused by that. But after some time, those gross things, gross things are not troubling us so much. But there are others which seem to be just going on and on and on. And the change doesn't seem to be happening. So that's why at that time, we need to focus on how our services, basically in devotion, there are two aspects. There is the connection with Krishna and there is contribution for Krishna. The connection with Krishna is not so easy to perceive. Or that whether the connection with Krishna is strengthening by my practice, that is not so easy to perceive. perceive. But the contribution for Krishna is something which we can perceive. Yeah, yeah, I did this service and this thing worked out. 
you know i i i gave this class and this person felt inspired by this i spoke this about and this person was inspired so we need some tangible markers of progress and success in our life also so the inner journey you don't we want to have such prominent or uh, regular markers that we will see that's why we also need outer markers now outer markers don't have to necessarily grow so i just distributed so many books or this they can be also some kind of markers but we can have some more subtler markers so basically if we see that by our practice of bhakti by our practice of our doing of seva some somebody is helped even if it's one person that is helped we can definitely see that there are senior devotees who are who are working very hard they are much more dedicated than us and they we can in our own small way assist them and yes we can maybe decrease a little bit of their burden and and if we are inspired by them and if we are able to decrease their burden that that also gives joy that also gives meaning to us so also as i said we can look at new people and if we share krishna bhakti with them and their life improves so we see that the dramatic changes in us have happened long ago now the changes are very gradual but if we share bhakti with others and we see some significant changes happening in others lives now so we think this is worth it so we have to find for ourselves uh, tangible markers of progress and success and keep moving forwards so what that will be we may have to do some inventory for that uh, and we may also take some guidance from our mentors so if we have to mitigate in a, uh, if we have to work we just work in a way that is there is a abstract or a subtle aspect to bhakti but there is also a concrete and uh, tangible aspect to bhakti so we need to have vision on both it can't be only this or only that if it's only this then we will just become uh, we'll just become like uh, yeah project oriented is like you could call it as corporate spirituality <laughs> <laughs> so spirituality is all about targets and goals and figures and these things that's not only it's it's not corporate spirituality it's it's actually spiritual spirituality so there is that aspect also but we we do have rajoguna within us we do have some mode of passion so we want to do something tangible in the world also so we can have we can have both kinds of goals and one we may be able to see more tangibly other may be less tangible okay thank you any other questions yes sir sir so when we feel stuck in a particular situation and uh, we feel weakened by that and we don't get the impetus to say expand our vision and refocus we start stagnating where we are what do we do at that time yeah see basically the we don't change till the cost of staying as we are exceeds the price of changing <laughs> say if we are staying in a particular home particular place we are staying and we can shift to maybe some other place now ah, if it oh shifting is so much trouble taking all this and going there but the price where we are it's increasing 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 
eventually when it becomes the disparity becomes very obvious hey i'm spending so much over here even if i shift and go there i won't have to be pay half of it also better let me shift over there so now with respect to say shifting a home uh, with the, we can have some more uh, concrete figures but with respect to our inner change the concrete figures are not so much there okay the price of changing and the cost of cost of staying over here and what, what what is more so it's not so easy to perceive that that's why uh, we need to at that time zero in on something that we feel inspired to do it's a uh, i was at a writing seminar so i was telling that some devotees were telling me that if we read books by those who are authors or the articles feel this article is so good this book is so good i can never write like this uh, sometimes we if we write, read something which is very good then we may some people may be inspired i also want to write like this some people may feel they lose inspiration i can never write like this so i said that sometimes we we can also you can look at the many people have their own blogs now and some blogs are well written some blogs are not at all well written it's um, some blogs you read and you feel you know who was the english teacher for this person <laughs> <laughs> so so what happens is that sometimes when you see something so i said that you read something if you read something which is very poorly written and you see that is also published he says reading that will inspire you i can do at least better than this <laughs> <laughs> so the mind is tricky and we can't go with a one formula all the time for dealing with the mind sometimes the mind is inspired by something which is much better than where we are oh i want to go there hmm? but the mind can also be this is here and this person this is this is getting for i can do better than this i want to do it so we have to see how we can get the motivation to move and sometimes even if we feel that this, this one thing i want to do change um, often it is when when we feel stagnated it's good to start with something very small if say you know we all many people get bhagavad gita as it is and then they keep it as it is <laughs> <laughs> okay i will read it one day hmm? but that one day it what happens that one day will come one day it becomes like that <laughs> so then you start okay i'll just read one verse every day can i do that ah yeah one verse i can do that but one verse what will happen no just read one verse every day bhagavatam just read one verse every day okay then what happens is Uh, we just start with very small steps so the idea is when we feel stagnated s s s small simple steps we start with something very small very simple and do it and then if with respect to inner change momentum is more important than movement i repeat this in inner change momentum is more important than movement so then what does that mean that means developing a habit of reading every day is much more important than reading a particular book i may decide next my max one month i am free i'll read every day 3 4 hours i'll complete maybe two cantos of bhagavatam three cantos of bhagavatam that's good okay i read the book but our purpose is not just to read scripture our purpose is to take shelter of scripture and taking shelter means reading it regularly we want to develop a habit so that's why sometimes we feel disheartened because we think i have and i have to make some big movement and i'm not making that big movement or the the effort in making that movement big movement is too much i can't do it now so we have to we have to reconceptualize inner change it's not so much of movement as momentum and if we develop that momentum every day i'll read even if i can't read one verse I just open the Bhagavad Gita. I can't read one verse in purport. Okay, I just read one verse. Can I do that? Yeah, I can do that. So that way, if we do, 
we'll find that we will keep moving forward and gradually things will improve so the momentum will also increase so that in the of status just start with small simple steps okay thank you the last question yes devotees versus uh, those who are not coming in and all devotees versus and then what, what I was thinking is you know when the POVP is completed within 50 years do you think there will be some uh, big change in the world like will does the amount of devotees increase can devotees like Krishna or a supposing force in terms of how people will perceive devotees versus not devotees Then no, uh, this what what is the what does the TOVP got to do with devotees and non-devotees? No, what I'm trying to say is this is talk and I, mean, I don't know if we should pay attention to or non-devotees or thing, but there is some talk in how the plans for the world or things for the world will change in terms of uh, astrological um, happenings and how that will affect consciousness. I'd like to take that question. <laughs> no, no, no. Let me try to rephrase if I can. Yeah. So, we see there's a huge gulf between, say, devotees and non-devotees. And will, in the foreseeable future, some changes, maybe astrological changes or, say, building of the TOVP, yeah. will that decrease the gulf or will it increase the number of non-devotees becoming devotees? Will, uh, can we say that in the in the foreseeable future there's a big there's going to be a big change? Yes. That's the question, isn't it? Okay. Mm, there are two different things over here. One is that what we as individuals can do. The other is that what are the big changes that are going to happen. Okay, going back to the boat ma boating metaphor, the uh, in the boat the person can keep rowing. Sometimes the wind might be in the same direction and the boat can just zoom forward. Sometimes the wind might be in the opposite direction and the boat will be almost blocked. But boat, despite the best effort, the boat might move in the opposite direction. Hmm. So all that is in the hands of the uh, rower is to keep rowing. But it's not just to keep rowing, but also to try to sense which direction is the wind flowing where. And then for, bo for those who are rowers, Catching the right wind is also very important. If they catch the right wind, they can their efforts get augmented. So similarly for all of us, when we are trying to ourselves practice bhakti and share bhakti and we see the difference between uh, the devotional way of living and the non between the devotees and non-devotees, what we can do at our level is keep trying to share. Hmm? Keep trying to share bhakti, keep trying to practice and share it with others. And beyond that, there are, within bhakti, different people can have different sources of inspiration. Some devotees may feel that if we just build this temple, then the outreach can expand enormously. Some devotees may say that, oh, you know, if we just distribute more books, then people will become. Some people may, some devotees may say, oh, actually, you know, we need to customize. Instead of building a one big temple, we need many small centers. And many people will come locally at the small centers. So now, is it that within the practice of the bhakti, there can be many definitions of success? Hmm. So ultimately, it's sharing Krishna with others. But what are the ways in which we share Krishna? That can vary. Some devotees may feel that, oh, you know, if you just build your homes and temples according to Vastu, you consult more astrology. And then you do things, then auspiciousness will come. Different people will have different ideas. And there is that room for individuality and diversity within spirituality. Now, it can well be that at certain times, certain definitions of success 
may become much more prominent than others. So, if it's so a different devotees will strive in different ways, and if something becomes more effective than others, then more people will start doing that. You know? Say, if we look at the history of our movement, when Shri Prabhupada came to the West, at that time he did not he he would not particularly studied American social cultural history or anything like that. He just came at a particular time and he tried to reach out to whoever he could. But by circumstance, gradually he came to the counterculture. And they were the most receptive for him. And that's how he took it up. So he looked at the context and he saw these are the people who are the most receptive. And his movement focused on the counterculture. But when he came to India, it was not uh, that there was no counterculture. Nobody was uh, wanting to leave their homes and, and the counterculture means people had already left everything. So Prabhupada says in a lecture that uh, people at that time, he, say, he says to the American disciples of hippies, he says you are, that they had, they had already done Sarva Dharma and Parityaj. Uh, I taught them Maam Ekam Sharnam Braj. <laughs> so they had already given up their duty to their family, to their uh, even their career, their education, their society, even their hygiene, everything. But Krish Prabhupada taught them. So Prabhupada, you could say that wind of the counterculture, Prabhupada caught that wind. And then he took everyone along, he took people along. Many, many people joined over there. But then when he went to India, India there was no counterculture. So Prabhupada, at that time there was the wind of, you could say, nationalism, cultural nationalism. Cultural nationalism is the idea that, oh, we Indians have been ruled by foreigners for so long. But now those foreigners are taking up our culture. How great our culture is, how great our nation is. So most of the people who came to Srila Prabhupada in the 1970s, none of them were really interested in becoming committed followers. So Prabhupada recognized that, that cultural nationalism, that, that is what oh, our, our culture and our nation is so great that these foreigners are taking it. So they wanted some visible manifestations of the greatness of, that, uh, of, the, of our culture and our nation. So Prabhupada channeled that and Prabhupada started the life membership program for getting people to support building big temples. So the idea is that, okay, this is the wind that is there. How do you channel that? So they, they were not ready to become, say, committed, uh, committed sadhaka bhak, sadhaka bhak, sadhakas. So then Prabhupada accommodated them. Now if you see today, most of our movement is neither the counterculture nor, say, life patterns. See, today the culture, today the whole need is that society is becoming more fragmented, mm, people are more mentally disturbed, and there's loneliness. So most people come to spirituality for a sense of community and belonging. Mm. Most people who come to spirituality are not missionaries out to change the world. Most, uh, most people who come to uh, we Krishna, Krishna conscious not that we uh, there is there is some amount of cultural nationalism within people but that's not the primary motive so then our movement is adopting that so we are focusing more and more on expanding the community having community support community care a temple becomes more a, a center for community to co congregate and to to connect so then whatever is the wind that is moving we need to catch that wind so so we could say in the 60s, it was the counterculture wind in America. In the 70s, it was the uh, na cultural nationalism wind that Prabhupada caught in India. From the 80s onwards, it was more, mostly Indians were coming. And it's more of the, you could say the spirituality as community kind of wind that is being caught. But now, if you see, there are different winds that are coming also. That is one is, it's the yoga is very big. So there are some devotees are catching the yoga wind. And so people come to practice yoga and then they, they get bhakti yoga. There is the environmentalism wind, which is also there. So green environmental consciousness is there. Some devotees are going into, we can have eco-friendly communities. That's a wind that some people are catching. There is also a wind of mindfulness mm -hmm. that we want to process our emotions better, become more aware. Now most people today, if you tell them you are not the body, 
they're not interested. It's too ab abstract and philosophical for them. But if you tell them you are not your mind, oh really? Explain to me how. <laughs> <laughs> so, you use mindfulness to share spirituality. And another, I think there are four broad things. There is trends, winds which are flowing, you could say. There's yoga, there's environmentalism, there's mindfulness, and there is veganism. So, in India, in the, you see, in India, people think, still think vegetarianism is old fashioned. To become modern means to become non veg. But in the West, to become vegan is cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so what is happening? Some devotees are using vegetarian cooking, hmm? vegetarian cooking kind of classes, vegan cooking, and they are getting people to Krishna. So we have to see which wind is there, and we try to catch that wind. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Itai Gaur Premanande. Chaitanya Charan Prabhu Ji ki. Yeah. Yeah.